Will you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the children. Thank you for their exuberance and joy of life. May we share that with them. We thank you also for Peter and for years spent with Jesus and the lessons that he learned. As we read his work, may he impart those lessons to us through your spirit. Uh, we ask it in, his, in Jesus' name. Amen. Reminder that in your bulletins, there's a place for you to take some notes. It says head, heart, and hands. And where it says head, if you learn something, write it down there. Where it says heart, if, if it moves you in some way, write it there. And where it says hands, then something to do when you leave here. Um, and I know that there are at least four applications in my sermon this morning. The question is, can I remember them? But there's four of them. And so at the bottom, where it says hands, you can write them there. Now, I don't want to put pressure on you, but the first service got this, so I hope you will. Uh, <clears throat> there was a man with one hand who went to a thrift store, and he walked up to the counter, and he asked the woman behind the counter, I'd like to, can I make an appointment? She said, sir, this is a thrift store. Just help yourself. And he looked confused for a moment. And then the light came on, and he said, oh, excuse me. I was told this was a second-hand store. Okay, you know, I've been told that people have a hard time knowing when I'm telling the truth or being serious and when I'm not, not a good thing for a pastor. So this actually happened. I just want to clue you in. This actually happened. Man went shopping at, at, at a thrift store looking for something in particular and he looked on all the shelves and he wandered around the store and then he got to the back of the store and there were a pile of boxes, stuff that had just been brought in and the shopkeeper hadn't had time to kind of go through what was in there and so he was rooting around in the box and you know what's in the box. It's all the junk we take to the thrift store. Detritus of life, the bric-a-brac that we have to dust all the time and uh, torn and dirty clothes and worn out shoes and but at the bottom of the box there was a, a pot a teapot but it was dirt encrusted somebody had used it for a planter turned it into a flower pot had dead leaves stuck to it and it was full of dirt and it was gross so he picked it up out of the bottom and realized this isn't an earthenware cheap tea, teapot this is porcelain and it had a, a little hairline crack on one side and it was chipped along the edges um, but he disguised his delight at the find, and he went up and he paid the person at the counter $20 for the teapot, and then he went home with it, and he cleaned it up, and he cleaned the inside out, and got rid of all the dirt, and he cleaned the outside and polished it up, and made it almost as if it was new again. Um, and now I want you to imagine that the person who dropped it off in the box at the thrift store comes back to the thrift store. Um, my wife wants her tea, uh, flower pot back. And the proprietor says, well, I'm sorry, but I sold it. I sold it to so-and-so. So the guy goes to so-and-so's house and says he'd like his teapot. No, you can't have your, your pot back. Um, I have washed it inside and out, and I have buffed it and polished it and shined it up, and I've made it almost as if it was new. And I returned it to the purpose for which it was created. It wasn't a flower pot. It was a teapot. And the point is that you, you are the teapot. You have been dropped and cracked and chipped along the edges, and life has been difficult and hard and brutal. And in verse 18, Peter gives us the most significant word, the important word in our passage, ransomed. That you were ransomed, you were redeemed, you were bought back at great cost. And now you belong to the one who made you. You belong to the one who gave you meaning and purpose for your existence. You're a teapot, not a flower pot. Somebody said after the second service they wanted me to stand up here and sing I'm a little teapot. But, <laughs> but I don't know that song, so I can't do it. Um, now, here's the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. Um, this actually happened, and the guy cleaned the pot up, and he put it out to auction. Turned out that it was one of the first pieces of porcelain ever made in America. It was made by a British craftsman named John Blanton. That's not right. Um, and it sold at auction for $806,000. Why doesn't that ever happen to me? <laughs> I go to thrift stores all the time, and I don't come home with anything that's worth $806,000. Anyway, so Peter, picking up where Peter is in this letter, he wants us to understand that we have been redeemed. 
that we have been ransomed, that God has gone to great lengths and great expense to make us who we were created to be, who he wants us to be. Now, before our passage starts in verses 15 and 16, he called you to be holy. Be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And holiness gets a bad rap. Holiness in some people's minds is Phariseeism. It's rule keeping. It's walking around with a dour face and hating life. And that's not what holiness is. It's not being judgmental. It's not being self-righteousness uh, or filled with self-righteousness. This is the way many people understand holiness. Holiness is simply the flower pot got picked up and cleaned up and washed up and it was returned to the purpose, set apart for the purpose for which it was created. Holiness means set apart. And so it isn't about being religious. It isn't about sniffing in the presence of people who are who are bad people. That's, that's not what holiness is. It's not keeping yourself away from people of the, of the world. Otherwise, we'd have to be taken out of the world. Peter is saying, conduct yourselves with holiness. That we, in the way that we live our lives, are a witness to the one who made us, and to the one who bought us back, and to the one who polished us up, do we clean up ourselves and do we fix ourselves? No. He does. The one who bought us, the one who redeemed us, the one who ransomed us. He is the one who does the work on us and not us who work on ourselves. Now, he gives us some clues and hints, Peter does. And so in verse 17, he wants us to conduct ourselves appropriately. He wants us to do that for a couple of reasons. One is the nature and character of God. Who's the one who redeems us? Who's the one who went searching for us? I love the Heidelberg Catechism. The 54th question is that Jesus Christ, from the beginning of the world to its very end, gathers, protects, and preserves for himself a people destined for eternal life, destined for a community called the church. And of that community, I am and I always will be a living member. That he's gone to great lengths to bring me into his family. And so that we ought to bear the marks of the family and understand the values of the family and live our lives like a member of that family. That's what Peter is talking about. So we do it on the nature of the basis of the character of God. Or we obey because of the great cost to which God has gone to bring us home. Why would we not want to show him appreciation and gratitude for what he has done for us in our redemption? You remember the story because Peter's taking it right out of the Bible. This is Exodus chapter 12. Israel is serving, are serving as slaves in Egypt. They're living lives of futility, of emptiness, of barrenness. They were created to be a people of God, a holy nation, proclaiming the excellencies of God to the ancient world, and instead they were subjugated. Instead of being the teapot in porcelain that they were created to be, they were turned into a flower pot and filled with a bunch of junk and broken and chipped. And so God has redeemed them and brought them back. And so we're grateful to God for what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. And that we need to avoid presumptuous sins. Some people have this image of God that he's just an old man in a rocking chair in the heavens. And he's rocking and says, oh, boys will be boys. And he winks at our sin. Or because he's our father, he'll forgive us. So I'm going to go ahead and do this thing that I know is wrong because I know that God will forgive me because he's my father. But Peter says, verse 17, beware of that. Our God is our Father, but He is an impartial judge. If it's wrong, you'll get called on it. If it's wrong, you will be held accountable for it. You're not going to get away with it just because God is love. He is love. 1 John 4, 18, our God is love. But understand this too, love is not God. That's a category mistake. We've got a lot of churches in this world that are teaching that love is is God and that it's not loving to tell somebody something that they do is wrong it's not loving to tell somebody that their behavior is out of bounds and beyond the pale that that's that hurts their feelings and it's not loving it's like telling children who want candy for breakfast go ahead and have all the candy you want that's not loving 
I'm married to a woman who loves me enough to tell me, hey, that was, that was out of line. Hey, that was over the top. Hey, come back here, you. Not all the time. But when I'm over the line, she loves me enough to do that. We do that for our children. And God does that for us. Hebrews chapter 12 is a chapter about discipline. God, whom the Lord loves, he spanks. All discipline for the moment seems not joyful, but sorrowful. You remember this? This is going to hurt you more than it's going to hurt me. But it's true that God loves us enough, enough to discipline us. So that's where Peter begins. And then he gives us four strategies or four ways that we can live out this holy life. What does holiness mean? Peter now will explain to us what holiness means. First, in verse uh, 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways, I'm sorry, the end of verse 17. Okay, each one's conduct yourselves with fear throughout your time of exile. So the first way that we live a holy life is we live understanding that we are strangers, that we are aliens, that we are exiles, that this world that we live in is not our home. We live on it, but we are not of it. Paul puts it this way, my citizenship, Philippians 3.20, my citizenship is in heaven from which I eagerly await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our ultimate allegiance belongs to the King of Kings. Our ultimate allegiance belongs to Jesus Christ. It belongs to no flag. It belongs to no country. Patriotism is a virtue. Patriotism is love of place where you grew up, love of neighbor, the people that you grew up with and around, and loving them. That's appropriate. We should do that. Nationalism is a form of idolatry. America's a Christian nation. America's a chosen nation. That's all hogwash. Christian nations and chosen nations don't abort 60 million babies. So we got to get over this idea of nationalism, understand the difference between nationalism and patriotism, and understand that both bend their knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are exiles. We are strangers in this land. Or as Larry Norman used to sing, this world is not my home. And so one of the ways that we demonstrate to a watching world our holiness is just understanding that we don't live and die by who wins or loses an election. We don't win or die by decisions made by our politicians. Because at the end of the day, this world is not my home. So that's the first. The second one is redeemed. We are his redeemed people. Live like it. It cost God a great deal to buy us back. It cost God the life of his son. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in um, uh, called uh, Discipleship. What's the name of that book? Cost of Discipleship. Compares and contrasts cheap grace and costly grace. And grace, while it's free, isn't cheap. It's free, but it isn't cheap. It cost God the life of his son. And so we dare not treat what cost God a great deal as if it has no value. So we live as the redeemed. We live as those for whom Christ has laid down his life. And we show it in gratitude that we are grateful for this life. We are grateful for our blessings. We are grateful for our families and our church family. We are grateful that we have the freedom to hold a Bible in our hand and to read from it and to gather publicly to praise and to worship our God. These are great and huge blessings. If you don't believe me, ask somebody from China or ask somebody from North Korea or ask somebody who's living under the oppression of, the, of Islam in Nigeria or in the Middle East. We have been greatly blessed and we show forth that blessing in gratitude for being a redeemed people. Now, Peter goes on to tell us that there are two ways in which we are not redeemed and one way in which we are. The first of the two ways that we are not redeemed. Peter says that we grew up um, not according to the futility, the feudal lives which we inherited from our forefathers. Lives like a flower pot where we're cracked and we're dirty and we're chipped and we're beat down and we don't understand why we're here. We don't understand who we are. We don't understand this world or our place in it. Peter says no. 
You are redeemed people and you have been bought back and you are not by the futility, that Greek word means empty, it means vain, it means useless. Your lives are not empty, they're not vain, they're not useless. As a sullen teenager who didn't understand his place in the world, I was suicidal, I was angry. I didn't, I didn't know this, I didn't understand myself, I didn't understand this world or my place in it. And I went on a weekend with Young Life and they shared the gospel with me and suddenly I knew who I was and I knew why I was here. Hopefully you all know who you are and why you are here. That God has bought you and he has a mission and a purpose for you that you were created for. And that that is part of your redemption. Not to futility, but to life of purpose and life of meaning. That's part of it. The second thing that we are not redeemed by are perishable things like silver or gold. Oh, there's that guy on TV, turn all your savings into silver or gold, it's permanent, it'll last forever, and it never goes up, down in the market, and, and it'll always be... According to Peter, that's temporary. According to Peter, that's perishable. Did you know that gold is the paving material of the world to come? Who wants to pack up a bunch of paving material and take it with them to the next life? It doesn't have eternal value or significance, but something else does. And in the next verse, Peter tells us what that something else is. Where am I? Not in that book. Verse 19. Here's what we were redeemed with. The precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish or spot. The precious blood of Christ. Cost God the best that he had for you. Not for other people in general, but for you personally. You were redeemed with what? With blood as of a lamb without blemish or spot. He's back in Exodus 12 again. He's reminding them that they've come out of slavery. They've come out of bondage. They now live in freedom. They now have meaning and purpose and they get to decide for themselves what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. Because they've been freed and that it is for freedom, according to Paul in Galatians 5.1, it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. So that we are not to be subject again to a yoke of bondage. We owe our loyalty and our obedience and our honor to Jesus. And if we live out in these practical ways that we are strangers, that we are redeemed people, and that the redemption has been purchased for us at great cost, we will be a marvel and a revelation to those around us. It's not that we sniff and huff and, and oh, those people are so dirty and they're so gross. That's, that's not it at all. It's that we, are, we understand who we are. God loves us so much that he gave his son for us. That ought to bring us joy. That ought to bring us hope. And then Peter goes on. We didn't get dropped and have a crack in the side of us and, and have chips along the edges uh, as an accident. God didn't have slippery fingers. It says in verse 20 that Jesus, this plan, our redemption was foreknown before the foundation of the world. That this was always plan A. God knew what was going to happen to us. God knew that we would end up in slavery, that we would be oppressed, that we would be beaten down and cracked and chipped. And from before he created anything, he made a way for us to come home, a way to be a part of his family, a way for us to be in right relationship with him and to live lives of meaning and purpose. And then verse 21, through him you are believers. And so here's the third way. First, we're strangers. Second, we're redeemed. Third, we are to live by faith and hope. Verse 21, by faith and hope. We know that faith is an integral part of the life of faith or the Christian faith. The author of Hebrews says in chapter 11, verse 6, it, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For who comes to God must believe that God is and that he rewards those who seek him. That's who God is. He's gone to the junk shop of this world and he's fished around in that box in the back where everything has been basically discarded and thrown away. And he has taken you out and he has polished you up and he has fixed you up. Do you believe that? Because it's faith in that person, not faith in ourselves. It's not faith in faith. It's faith in a person. It's a faith in Jesus Christ. And that that faith is also tied together with hope. 
that on Easter, God planted his flag in this world. This world is mine. And he raised Jesus from the dead. He vindicated his Christ. And that we have hope for our lives in this world because God raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus isn't dead and moldering in some grave. Jesus, it wasn't some tragic, terrible thing that happened. In screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis talks about a guy, not in screw tape, in um, uh, it's a bus trip from the great divorce. It's a bus trip from hell to heaven. Don't get old because it's a bag of downers. It's a bus trip from hell to heaven. And there's a clergyman on the bus, and he's in heaven. And he's looking around, and it's great, but he's, I'd like to stay, huh, but I have to go back to hell because I have to give a lecture to a bunch of other clergymen who are in hell, warning to Matt, who are in hell about what would Jesus' mature views have been if he hadn't been so tragically killed and he died at such a young age. Clergy who absolutely don't have a clue and who don't get it. We are to have faith and hope in a God who raises Jesus from the dead. And then finally, Peter, the fourth of these ways to show our holiness, to live out holy lives, is by loving. Verse 22 and 3. You've purified your souls by obedience to the truth for what? A sincere brotherly love. Sincere is unfeignedly. It is without hypocrisy, that we love without a mask on. And that is so hard to do in this world because people hurt us. And so we cover up and we hide. How are you doing? Fine. What's new? Nothing. And we cover up and we hide and we don't love them sincerely. We're not allowed to love our, ourselves or our loved ones sincerely because the world calls on us to duck and cover. No, it's a sincere love. It's a transparent love. It's an authentic love. It's being real with yourself, with God, and with other people. It's a sincere, not fake love. And he continues, you're to love one another earnestly. Jesus was asked, what's the most important thing in the whole Old Testament law? Love the Lord your God, Mark 12, 30, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. That's an earnest, a fervent, an intentional, and an intent, deep love. And that this is the way that we're supposed to love each other and love God. This is what we were created for. That's part of our meaning and our purpose. If we actually loved one another, you think the world might notice? Instead of 30,000 denominations, if we were all part of one church, do you think the world might sit up and take notice? Jesus said in John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And by this, the world will know that you're my disciples. But instead, we've got 30,000 denominations, and we argue about the rights that are supposed to bring us together, baptism. How much water do you need, and where do you need to put it? And we fight about it. Really? During the War of 1812, Andrew Jackson, who went on to become our seventh president, was the commander of the Tennessee militia. And things were not going well during the War of 1812, at least initially. And morale had hit rock bottom. The officers were complaining about the enlisted. The enlisted were complaining about the officers. They were living in dirty conditions in a lousy camp with crummy food. And all they did was whine, 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 and pick at each other. And argue with each other. And finally, he'd had enough. So Jackson, General Jackson, got them all together. And he said, gentlemen, the enemy is over there. Now, there's a word about church unity. Um, your brothers and sisters in Christ are not the enemy. We need to stop treating them as if they're the enemy. Christians of good conscience disagree about matters of doctrine. And we're an interdenominational church. That means that we have differing opinions in this room. And that's okay. Because the things that we agree on trump the things that don't. Or in Lynn's children's time, the big picture, the important things are more important than the little nitty gritty secondary and tertiary details. We need to major on the majors and not mi major on the minors. And then finally, how are we to manifest this love? 
We are to love sincerely, we are to love earnestly, and we are to love from a pure heart. How do we do that? Because he goes on to say that we have been born again. Not born of man, not born of woman, but that we are born of God and that He is our Father. That's where He started out in verse 17. He is our Father and we are one another's brothers and sisters. And that we are to live in love and unity with one another. And how is it that we were born again? By the power of the Word of God. That's what Peter is teaching us. And so here are four ways in which we live out our holiness, for practical ways in which we demonstrate to a watching world what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Do we love one another? Do we understand that this world isn't our home, that there's something better for us, and that we can hold the things of this world lightly, and that when things don't go well, well, we can hold that lightly too because we know that another day is coming, that Jesus will come again in glory. We just confessed it. He'll come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and that all of these things pass away and that we have been assured of a different life, an eternal life, in a place where the one who redeemed us and bought us and fixed us, in a place in relationship with him and with one another, in which we will find joy forever. Peter is writing to a church that is being persecuted. Peter's writing to a church in which, in their fear, and in their frustration, they're turning on one another and hassling one another. And he's exhorting them to live into their calling as children of God. That's all holiness is. To be set apart that our behavior, our attitudes, our understanding about this world and our place in it are different from those of the world. They want to make us flower pots. Jesus wants to make us teapots. Amen.